stage because we saw what the the job givers we are seeking from fresh school givers. So we decided to invite a resource person there to the school to carry out the training and after that I just picked interest. I was like, this is a good thing to do. So when I left school, first three years, I didn't have no salary. I went to serve. Just like apprentice we serve under a master. So everybody volunteer to work with that organization without pay, okay. moved on in that organization from just a volunteer to become a partner, wow, I knew transitioned from partner. partnership into, you said, three, oh, four okay. years. My wow, first three, know. four years after school, I didn't earn a salary. Whoa. Yeah, sure. So, so wow. after partnership, the partnership didn't work beyond say two years, so we had a mutual dissolution of that partnership, and then I had to go solo. It took me another two years. Went on a grant for two years again to restructure the business to be able to run. Because working as a partner and working as a principal partner, they are two different things. You sometimes you don't understand some things that a principal partner does. Yeah. So I had to go on a grant for two years. We managed after two years and picked up again and by God's grace we are doing well now. Staff base, direct oh, staff base. So what's your Just like apprentice, we sat down. What's your I'm working as a principal partner of friends. You sometimes Okay, let's say okay, my I have two areas that I really work on because my master's is in head policy and management. So I'm a health management specialist. Then also, I specialize in emergency mm -hmm. medicine. So, as you know, as a health yeah. 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 management yeah. is important yeah. and an emergency yeah. job again. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so, emergency yeah. medicine, health yeah. yeah. management is direct staff. So, what is the interview? So, right now, how about recording? So, uh, we've already established that you are a health management specialist and an emergency trainer. So, this leads to the next question. I know that this word has been uh, used loosely since I was little. Um, every child right now in school, let's say from kindergarten three to primary one, throughout primary five or primary six, as the case may be are taught first aid. So I, I know what it is on the surface, but I really want to know the, the pros and the cons of first aid. So tell us about that. Okay, basically, first aid in simple man term will refer to the care that is provided for persons who need urgent attention, okay. usually before advanced medical help arrives. So right now, before now, you say before the victim gets to the hospital, but right now, an hospital can come to you. You don't need to go to an hospital. So there are some yeah. ambulances that are more advanced than some emergency departments in some hospitals. So basically, it's what, first aid is important, is what everybody should be able to do to help a person who has a medical emergency. And a medical okay. emergency would be a medical situation that requires urgent attention. Too much delay in such cases. Is to the hospital. Okay, However, there are certain conditions. Okay, basically, okay, it will depend on the expertise of the people involved. For okay. me, for example, as a healthcare professional, there will only be any case that I cannot do something initially. If it is just handling the person appropriately, I'll give a simple example, stroke, for example. I heard of a case not too long ago of a close family associate who suffered a stroke. And what killed him eventually was not the stroke, but the way he was carried in route to the hospital. 
So, because when there's a stroke, people will tend to vomit, and when they vomit, there's a risk that their vomitors will go back into their mouth. When it goes into their mouth, because they are not fully conscious, it can roll down into their airway. This can wrap the pipes on our neck, the airway and the food waste, so the track here. And the track here is such that when any strange object that was not there appears to a part of the track here, it will also lock itself. So these people, because of wrong carriage, you can see them putting them lying flat in the bed while moving them to the studio. Their vomitors will go and lead into their airway and they will lock. So many of them die of choking, not the stroke. Okay, so, so something as simple as handling a patient effectively could be first. So let me just structure it this way. Let me put it this way. There's only something to do in any medical situation. Okay, now I but have what you should do should be based on your competence. If you don't know what to do, you will not say that Okay, so I have an expertise of the people. When you watch movies and a person suffers a gunshot wound, for me, for example, as a health care professional, there are many things that I cannot do something illegal. If it is just handling the person appropriately, if it's a good example, a stroke, for example, I had a case not too long ago of a close family associate who suffered a stroke. And what you did in the time was not said, but the way it was carrying the person is not a sense of bleeding or blood loss. One of the methods adopted is what we call direct pressure. So, because when there's a stroke, the people will tend to put pressure on the body and absorb it. That is some sort of material that can absorb blood to the blood pressure to the blood and blood clot formation. That can roll in the blood and the blood clot formation. So, it's a universal way of process to follow a medical management, irrespective of all kinds of bleeding. So, it's a good approach to apply pressure to that point to stop blood loss. So when you apply pressure, you send blood back into circulation, you ensure or you give opportunity for blood clots to form around the point of opening and the vessel can see by itself. So it's the wisest thing to do whenever there is any breakage that leads to bleeding to apply pressure. But there are some things they do there that may not be too, how I put it, too... Ideal? Right. For example, Tying the parts too tight can lead to cellular death of the affected parts. So in time, we don't just tie anyhow. There are some rules that govern tying any body part. For example, whenever you tie any body parts to reduce blood loss, your smallest finger must be able to slide beneath or underneath the rope or the material used in time. Why? If it is so tight, yes that you have stopped blood loss. Let me assume that you can see my skin. There is this part. What I've just done is that I have stopped blood loss from this leakage. Yes. At the same time, I have stopped blood flow to this arm. Mm -hmm. I remember I need this arm to stay alive. Without blood flow, oxygen and other nutrients cannot flow to this arm. So what do we see at the end of the day? When you tie too tightly for too long, eventually, this arm becomes affected, so to lead to what we call gangrene, decaying of that part, and at the end of the day, we have to cut off the hand. So what happened was we, an injury could be stabbed, it could be a cut, it could be gunshot, yeah. whatever it is. At the end of the day, what makes them amputate the hand was not the injury in the first place. It was a management approach yeah. adopted as first stage. So you're talking about the pros and the cons of first aid in the first place. So first aid becomes detrimental when the providers do not understand the principles behind their actions. So people just observe people do things and they do. For example, somebody faints. Fainting occurs either when there is reduced glucose or reduced oxygen supply to the brain. So fainting in simple terms is supposed to be a good thing. Whenever the brain is not getting enough of what it needs to survive, it goes to temporary rest. So that's fainting saves the person from dying. It's not your duty to wake the person up. It is your duty to correct what caused the fainting in the first place. And I gave you two common examples. Reduce sugar and reduce oxygen. So what do we see people do? They pour them water. You know why that would 
will be the case. It will reduce the body temperature, cause cold. And when there is cold, blood doesn't flow very well around the body. Remember the problem in the first place was that this person was not getting adequate circulation of glucose or oxygen. Now you now pour water and the person's temperature is now lower. Blood is not flowing very well. You are ending up complicating the problem that you were trying to save the person from. What else do we see them do? We say, that, okay, help me lift him up. Help me carry him up. Carrying him up is the wrong thing to do. Why? Lifting up the person, you are saying oxygen and glucose that is available flow to the leg and the arms. While your focus is the head, you are lifting him to his grave. In simple terms, that's what we say. You pour him water, you are waiting him for his coffee. That's what we say. So we don't pour them no water. We don't lift them up. We lift them on the floor and correct whatever the problem was. Finally, what do they do? You see them crowding the person. Crowding yeah. would be detrimental. Why would that be the case? I told you that one reason why people faint is to poor oxygen circulation. So if we crowd up people, toxic gas, so rather than the person breathing in free oxygen in the environment, is breathing in more of our carbon that we are exhaling. So we never crowd them, we never pour them water, and we do not leave them up. That's eye-opening, honestly. Eye-opening. Thank God that we got it. I'll have to, okay, go ahead, no problem. Let me put it at that. Go ahead, no problem. Yes. Sure. This conversation is getting interesting. I'm glad that uh, you sorted that, that uh, misconception. Clearly. So let's move on. What, I know what CPR is. Resuscitation. We first need to know who needs cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Not just anybody who need CPR. So you don't just see anybody fall on the floor and you just put your hand on the person's chest and you begin to press or compress. So there are many conditions that may be concurrent to the person who is on the floor. So some people may have just fainted, temporarily lost consciousness. For anybody to be given CPR, Be responsive. So two simple things you can check for. One, in person, so when you hit the person, you shake or you do whatever that should naturally be the seat response. The person is unresponsive. So when you see a breathless and an unresponsive person, that person yeah, needs it the simply person means to that the heart, the, the lungs, system. and the brain of that person is shut down. So your duty in CPR is to help the person circulate blood and supply oxygen because the heart is supposed to be the organ that helps us circulate blood while the lungs are supposed to help us ventilate or take in oxygen. So these two organs are done. I don't want to go deep into the causes of that, but in simple terms, anybody can suffer that condition. It's called a cardiac arrest or heart arrest. So a person can just be walking on the street and suddenly the heart will stop pumping blood. The moment the heart of a person stops circulating blood, the brain will shut down and the person is going down at that particular point in time. So it can happen to anybody irrespective of the age, irrespective of the gender. There are no peculiarities that make a person more predisposed to this condition than the other. So a teenager, a youth, an adult, or even a child can come down with a cardiac arrest at any point in time. So when this occurs, we have a very short time frame to act. Now, most of the people that saw a video in Benin City, was it a year ago or two years ago, the proprietress of the school was dancing during the, uh, what they call the like, graduation ceremony, and she slumped and fell, no ball was there in Benin. And they started to pour out water, and they were rushing out from that point to UBT. Paraji, for those who know football very well, slumped and died at the National from the stadium to Lunes. And if you know Lagos very well, that's about close to 30 minutes journey. Samuel Okwaraji died in the stadium. 
We have had situations where pastors, imams, the religious leaders slum in church. I have a friend whose father died in church during praise and worship, and they were casting out demons. And there was no demon there at that time. The only thing there was the spirit of death. And the spirit of death doesn't need casting out. Life appears and death will disappear. So what they needed to do was to give life to that body on that day. But they did not know the right way to give life to that body on that day. So whenever we have a person who stop breathing, and who is lifeless, just know in your head that this person's heart has stopped working. And for that person, you have barely few minutes to help that person stay alive. Anything beyond about four or five minutes in your intervention, that is, you wait beyond that time threshold before acting, usually the victims will either be dead or if they manage to come back to life, they will be vegetables for the rest of their life. That is, they will remain in coma for the rest of their life and eventually we we'll allow them die passively in the hospital. So whenever we have anybody who suddenly becomes lifeless and stops breathing, you are supposed to begin CPR immediately. The aim of CPR would be to help the heart circulate loss. When you put your hand on that chest and you are pressing it down, you are taking over the function of the person's heart. When you put something over the person's mouth and you push in air, you are taking over the function of the person's lungs. So you are becoming the person's heart and the person's lungs when you carry out CPR. But take me, not everybody needs CPR. To be qualified for CPR, the person needs to first and foremost be lifeless. Two, yeah. the person needs to be breathless. So don't do CPR on the person who fainted. Don't do CPR on the person who is sleeping. Don't do CPR on the person who can still move, who can still talk, and who can still breathe. Mm. I'm curious, what's going to happen if you uh, perform CPR on the person who is still breathing? Who still alive? Okay. Okay, basically you are going against the body's how do I call it now functioning. So it becomes counterproductive. So imagine overfeeding a person, the child just finished sucking breast. The child will regurgitate. So let me say there will be regurgitation of blood in the body. I don't want to put it bit too hard out to work, but eventually you are like to kill that heart that wow. is working at that point in time. So that's why we said, first aid is not just what any Tom, Dick and Harry will just do anyhow. There are yeah, principles to follow. There are things you must see before you act, and there's a way to act. So in emergency, we say, doing nothing at all is better off than doing the wrong thing. I'll give you a simple example of a case. You mentioned the issue of drowning. Yeah. Basically, Drowning simply means the person died in water. So the best word you should have used is called near drowning, nearly drowned. So if a person comes and says, I drowned, he's telling me he died and he died. woke up again. And dead people don't talk. So he nearly drowned, he near drowned. Loss of consciousness or injury in water. So what do we see people do when people drown or near yeah. drown? You see them pressing their stomach to push out the water from their tummy. It's very wrong to do so. You see people putting their mean? mouth over the person's mouth to suck out the water. It's also a waste of time and energy. So we see that in movies. You mentioned movies in, initially. Yeah. Yeah. The movies will be the worst place for you to learn first aid. The worst place for you to learn first aid because nobody censors the actions that they carry out there. A producer can just write a script based on his own imagination. I saw a movie some time ago. Was it this, uh, an Indian movie? Uh, I forgot the name. And the woman was giving birth and she yeah. entered cardiac arrest. And he took batches from a vehicle and he shot the woman back to life. Uh, all he said, da na 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 an yeah. automated external distributor to shock the person yeah. back to life. You can't learn it from any of those series. If you do so, you are likely going to kill more people than helping them. Let me tell you what we have when you press the tall stomach of that person. When people fall into water, the reason why you see them fighting inside water 
when they cannot swim is because water tries to pass through their nose and their mouth. As much that's on the neck. What is the air pipe? Whenever anything strange passes through the air pipe, what does it do? It will lock. So that person who is near drowning cannot breathe anymore because the airway has locked itself. So the Sorry. only pipe now available for water to go through is the pipe that leads to the stomach called the esophagus. So that's why when you bring them out of water, their stomach is distended. Oh. You see it swollen with yeah. water. But the question water. we often ask people is this. When you drink water naturally, where does it go into? Moderator, can you answer me? Your stomach. So the water in that person's stomach at that point in time, when you bring them out of the pool, is not a problem. Water is in its natural habitat. It would have been a problem if the water had gone into the person's lungs. Mm. But now what do you see people do? When they try to force the water out of the stomach, which is not necessary, as the water comes from the stomach trying to come to the mouth, remember the airway comes before the mouth. A lot yes. of the water will go into the airway. It can choke the person. It can go into the lungs and cause pneumonia or other form of infection in the person's lungs. So as a rule, never you apply pressure on the stomach of a near drowned victim to push out water. All you need to do is to assess, is this person breathing? Is this person still having life or responsive? If the person is not breathing, is lifeless, start your CPR immediately. Meaning that near drowning has led to a cardiac arrest. Okay, what is the person? If the person is still breathing, and still has life in the person, just turn the person to the side because likely the person will start to vomit very soon because the water in the stomach is in excess. So if he's lying on his or her back and he or she starts to vomit, just like that stroke person I told you about, there's a risk yeah. for what? Aspiration, water rolling into the airway. So yeah. to prevent that, we just turn the person to the side. So just in case he or she starts vomiting, the water will slide down from the side of the mouth. Okay. So we don't keep them on their back. We keep them by their side if they are breathing and they are light. You see, I have life. But if there's no life and they are not breathing, start your CPR immediately. Okay, great. So let's move on to ADP briefly. What is ADP? Okay, basically, the major reason why people's hearts will stop to pump blood suddenly. You see a person walking on the street, he just slums on the floor and he says it's to do or is it cause that is against the person. There is no cause anywhere against the person. What does happen is that the, the way our heart works is that electricity have to run the heart to charge it, contract and relax. So the heart has an electrical component that charges it to work. The only time your heart sleeps and my heart sleeps is when we sleep. Yeah. In fact, in our sleep, everybody dies in their sleep. The heart stops working when we sleep for a while, for about two to four, five, six, seven, ten seconds. So those who don't sleep, that's why they die early, because their heart never has any time to rest. So we all die in our sleep, but the heart picks up back again. So what happens is that a person who is still awake and alive, who suddenly have an electrical anomaly in the heart, that is when the electrical current is flowing anyhow, it's like in those days of black and white television, whenever there is no current, what happens to the picture? It becomes blurry and fuzzy. Yeah. So let us say there is now bad current or low current in the heart, in layman's term. So what happens to the heart? The heart starts to act fuzzy. So instead of the heart to contract properly and relax, the heart can start to just behave anyhow. Now that malfunctioning of the heart will not allow the heart pump blood effectively. So it's just a person walking on the street, normal electrical current is going to the person's heart. And suddenly that bad current just shows up. And that bad current can show up at any time and it can happen to anybody. So suddenly the heart that was pumping blood before just becomes fuzzy. Immediately the person is going down on the floor. Yeah. So what that machine does, that AED, is that when you apply it to the person's chest, it will send current to the person's heart. What that current will do is that that current will stop that fuzzy movement. It will stop that stupid electricity that is flowing. Remember, when electricity touches anything, it will stop. So that man's heart was just going, it wasn't pumping blood. So when you put an AED or that electrical current on the person, it will shock that person's heart, the heart will stop totally. So when the heart stops totally, awesome. so unless you stop that bad current, the normal current cannot come. 
God, it's awesome. So let's move on to BLS. What is that? Can you just briefly expatiate on BLS? Okay, BLS is one of the first aid courses that the world has adopted and it has helped a lot of persons stay alive. It simply means basic life support. Basic That's life. in simple terms. Uh, anybody can do to help another person during a critical life threatening emergency. I will underline that word critical life threatening. Not all emergencies are critical. Okay, what, Not what, all what, emergencies are life threatening. Okay. So, so what PLS focuses on, okay, for example, is cardiac arrest. When the person has symptoms of pumping blood, that's a critical life threatening emergency. The other one is choking. When food particles or substances suddenly locks the person's airway, yeah, I, I, and it can no longer breathe. I'll ask you this question really quickly. We see this in movies too. Please permit me that I. I'm always making reference to movies because that's that's the problem. That's the only time I see situations like this, you know. So why am I person is choking? You see somebody comes behind the person, holds the person tightly, especially in the stomach region, and starts pulling the person back to himself with so much force so that the food, you know, comes out of the mouth. I don't know, is that the ideal way to perform? Okay, sure, that sure, sure. It's supposed to yeah, that, that's, that's, that, that's a good approach. It's called the Helmich Maneuver. Okay. What okay. they try to do is to apply pressure on the abdomen to push okay. the diaphragm. The diaphragm okay. will come out from the lungs. In an attempt to come towards the mouth, the okay. air from the lungs will push out the other. So it's called the Helmich Maneuver. Okay. It's the right okay. approach to managing a child or an adult who is stupid. Don't do that for a baby. Okay, awesome. You don't do that for a baby. You can't apply pressure on a baby's abdomen. What we do for babies is what we call back slap. So, mm. in between the two bones, yes, called the scapula, you hit yeah, it powerfully yeah. to hit the baby cross. So, don't apply pressure on the baby's abdomen when the baby choke. And babies okay. choke more than adults. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. So, let's move so on you can apply a slap on the back for the baby. Go ahead, please, no problem. Yes, yeah, let's move on to the LSD. We're talking about the basic life. Um, Sorry, life support. Basic life support. So I said, there are those simple things anybody should be able to do to help a person who is dying. Okay, so I think the importance of that um, skill is so that you can render help to anybody who is in a critical condition of life and death. Right? Yeah. So you mentioned sure, earlier, yeah. You mentioned earlier that everyone should be able to perform uh, first aid, right? But you must know the right procedures, the ideal yes, uh, be trained. procedures. You must be yes, trained. Exactly. Yes. yes. So I, um, I'm thinking BLS uh, is an important skill for anyone who's in the health sector, correct? Very well. Yeah, so could you expatiate on that? Just Okay, basically, I'll give an example. Yes, but I supported the delivery process in a hospital in Ibadan. And during the delivery process, the due to poor initial management, the baby was born lifeless. The skin was wrinkled, the baby was white, the baby was as if for dead. And the funny situation was that that woman had previously five children, all five were girls. She was already close to 40, meaning she was a high risk pregnancy case. And that was the first male conception she has ever had. So the baby was born dead, the simple man's stem. So they threw the baby away, trying to save the mother's life. Fortunately for them, I was there on that day and I knew my basic life support. I knew that that baby was in cardiac arrest. That baby was not yet dead. If people don't just die. So now people they take them to the mortuary assuming they were dead. They were not yet dead. People could still do something for them. But because people there did not know what to do. So people there on that day, they were assumed to be health providers who should have known what to do. But fortunately or unfortunately, they were not knowledgeable enough for whatsoever reason. So I took the baby away from the other person and I started the CPR process. The transformation was from the white skin to blue skin, 
from blue skin to pink skin. The moment the baby's skin became pink, we heard the cry of the baby. <coughs> and everybody was happy on that day. Now imagine how many babies have been condemned dead because there was no me in the room. Me per se is not me as a person. But a person who is skillful enough. Yeah. So they would have ascribed it to the devil on that day. But the devil was on vacation in Alabama on that day. He was not in Ibadan. The devil is not omnipotent now or omnipresent. He right. has to be in a place at a time. So the devil wasn't in that room on that day. Ignorance was what was in the room. So a lot of people that have died, they died because of ignorance of people around them. People will perish for lack of knowledge and skill. So BLS is essential for healthcare providers because a lot of those emergencies that the BLS teach us to handle are emergencies that only the person who was present when it happened can do something about it. If we have to wait for external help to come, yeah. usually the victims are long dead before help can come. So, anybody who interacts with people in simple terms, churches, social gatherings, schools, hospitals, they should all know those BLS skills. Why? Anybody can be the victim of those conditions that BLS teach also. And I'll give you a very simple example. Someone organized a wedding ceremony and somebody was eating cake. You know many of these cakes can be very crunchy. Yeah. So, some of the cake party ceremony, you know that scattered that wedding or the reception because they were already married. Mm. The person died inside the reception room. So, because that nobody case, knew what, what to do. It's important yeah. that person was choking. Whenever you see anybody yeah. Yeah. for an adult who suddenly starts to hold the neck, mm. cannot talk, and they becoming restless. You're asking the person a question, he cannot talk, cannot talk. Just know that the airway is locked. And what locks the airway is strange mm. particles that go there. So, as simple as performing that abdominal pressure that we talked about earlier on can help push out the object that was in the airway and help the person breathe. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So as simple as that okay. procedure could have helped the person on that day, but the person died. Yeah. Okay, so I'd like to clear this because um, we're rounding up. Uh, in a household, choking, I, I wouldn't say um, serious the choking on a very serious level, but then uh, minor choking, you know, you, you swallow something, it hasn't, you still feel it here, you know, it hasn't settled, and they tell us to swallow mm -hmm. the big lump of your back. Um, okay, let me, let, me, let me address that. That's not choking. Yeah. I told you there are two pipes on the neck, so let's yeah. imagine this is pipe one, this is pipe two. Mm -hmm. So this pipe one goes to the lungs, pipe two goes to the stomach. Yeah. So that, the reason why you cannot breathe and swallow at the same time is that whenever you want to swallow food to go into the back pipe, something will come and lock the front pipe. It's called the epiglottis. And that's why we advise people not to eat and talk at the same oh. time. Because when you are talking, that cover or that valve that should lock the airway will be vibrating. So people are at a higher risk of choking when they talk and they eat. Because the food, instead of going to the back pipe, and find its way to the front pipe that should have been locked. So when you feel like there is still bone in your neck or something, it is in your esophagus, your foot pads. The person who is choking cannot talk to you. Mm, sure. The person who is choking will clean the neck and will be restless. For babies or for children, they will be eating their head as if pepper enter their head. Whenever you have that feeling of you are trying to swallow something and it becomes very peppery, something is coming from your nose or your head is hitting you up. What happened was that the food almost entered into the airway. So the airway locked and opened again. So that peppery sensation you felt for just a moment is yeah. the same feeling the person who is choking feels continuously. So the airway locked and tried opening again. So you who felt something in your neck, it was not. Ever in the air, so you cannot call right. that choking. Um, where can a person get 
uh, the training BLS in Nigeria? Okay, basically there are organizations and companies that carry out these trainings around Nigeria and our company is one of them, Numat Health Projects and Services. And currently we are partnering with the uh, Rafa to see how the training can be brought to a do state. Because our point. office is in Lagos and we go a lot, we, 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 we do trainings all over Nigeria and the other companies like us. So we are trying to see how we can extend our network and turn tackles. So Rafa is putting up something in Edo State and very soon they would make it known to everybody how people can get access to the training because the biggest challenge is not willingness to get trained but access to training. So we have people who are willing to be trained but where can I get trained? becomes a problem. So in Lagos, our uh, offices are 12 Odozi Street, Odudu Bega, and very soon we shall have an outlet in Benin City where people around that region can come for trainings on stipulated days. So right now, training is not too accessible outside Lagos and Abuja, and maybe a few places in Port Harcourt because of the cost of logistics and other things. But with the partnership we're having with Rafa, we believe that very soon, training for first aid will become more accessible to persons in the South South, especially in those states. So just watch out very soon. You will see adverts rolling out where you can come in at your own time or at your own leisure to get first aid training and all. Now, the challenge of first aid training is this. There are a lot of first aid trainings that are coming online. But with first aid, unless you practice, has yeah. on demonstration. You have learned nothing. I can read the book, I can watch things on YouTube. But unless I do it, I don't know that I can do it or if I cannot do it. So very soon the training will be available in Edo State where people can get okay. the training Great. at will. Awesome. So last question before you go. Uh, if, if anybody has a question, please if you just type that in the chat box and I'm gonna read it out and ask uh, Mr. Shagan. Okay, so my final question for you is, do you have any health story um, where, okay, fine, you, you mentioned where your VLS came in handy, um, that day in the garden where the child was born dead. So I want to ask if you have a health story, maybe a, a, a near-death experience, a life-changing health experience, do you have any? Okay, this guy, I'll show you. In room. He's a head trainer. On that faithful day, we are very deep. If not because his daughter was trained. So usually we tell people when they come for first aid training that it's not just enough you getting training, but when you train yourself on first aid, you are assuring the safety of people around you. Your own safety is not assured. What assures your own safety is for other persons around you to get trained. Because when you are the victim, who will save you? Most times, those cases you can't help yourself. So on that faithful day, his daughter helped him stay alive. And years back, we came to Benin at, I think, UPS, at University of Preparatory Secondary School. We trained close to maybe 500 students there because we saw that if that young girl, eight year old, could save the parents, we believe even school children can be trained to become these life savers. So that's a beautiful experience that saved the life of a friend of mine on that very day and we believe if everybody gets trained or we get more people to become trained we we'll avoid a lot of death people go for church camps and they bring their dead bodies back home people go for meetings and they come back home dead we see all sorts amongst family members and all so people really need to know what to do they need to be trained on what to do and we encourage as many persons that can sponsor such trainings in their groups Church groups, when women have conventions and groups, you can invite a trainer to come and have such a training for the women. Pastors of churches, monks, and the likes, you can invite such 
trainers to come educate their members because it's safer to do a testimony of a life that was saved than pay levies to bury people. Yeah. So we encourage religious houses, groups, communities to invest in such trainings because what you can do, you can never underestimate. And the value of a life, you cannot know on it until it is lost most times. So we can stop losing people if we can encourage more people to get trained. And everybody can become the advocate. We cannot rely on the government for this because the government has so much responsibilities that they are carrying out. So we have an NGO called the Rescue and Safety Support Initiative Nigeria that has been going around carrying out this training at subsidized rate and almost for free. So the organization Resting is open to partnership with interested communities and groups or organizations who would want this training stepped down to their members or their people. So you can contact us and then we'll see how modalities can be in place to have those trainings conducted in your environment. So thank you. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a very eye-opening um, session for the past 40 minutes. Thank you very much for joining uh, this conversation. It was an honor to have you. Thank you so much to everybody who joined. Thank you for staying with us. Thank you for actively listening and participating. And to you, Mr. Omoy Mapido, I hope to have this uh, kind of a interview with you again. Thank you for having me. Thank you to everyone who was around to hear us. Thank you. Yeah. It's a wrap. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Very well, sir. Thank you.